Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I've got uh, Axel Brower and Peter Kuhl back with me today because they're, uh, you know, very long-term Mississauga residents. They've been involved in residence organizations. Peter's been involved in uh, arts organizations. Uh, they've been involved in Rotary, et cetera, and they really know what's going on in Mississauga. I had Axel and Peter on about a month ago, and we were talking about the tax increases in Mississauga. And let me explain this to you for a second, if I could. So the Mississauga Council has announced that the tax increase for 2024 was, quote unquote, a modest 2.3%. But uh, work that Axel has done, as other people have done, says that that 2.3% is where they take the Mississauga tax increase and they divide it by the Mississauga taxes and the Peel taxes. And so therefore, they're underrepresenting the tax increase by almost a factor of three, two and a half to three, because if you took Mississauga taxes increases and divided by the Mississauga taxes, you'd actually get, I think it's 6.3%. And similarly, if you took the Peel tax increase, no. which is their announcement, and divided it by the Peel taxes and the Mississauga taxes, they announced it went up by uh, uh, something like 4.5%. Uh, uh, but in reality, Peel tax increase divided by Peel taxes is 8.4%. And so, therefore, they're underrepresenting the tax increase in Mississauga by a factor of, you know, almost 2.4 uh, percent, um, uh, and in in Peel, 2.4 times. I apologize, and in Peel by a similar factor. And the average overall tax increase is over seven percent. Actually, you've come out with this. You did a report on it. You've gone to the uh, to the council on it. You've gone to uh, numerous different organizations with the city on it. You went to the Miranot debate and raised it. Are people listening? Quiet. They refuse to respond. They keep on saying, well, go and look at the budget documents. And I say, no, wait a second. Look at your press releases. Who reads the budget? It has to be a ratio of 50,000 who listen to the press releases versus one who reads the budget. It's a 360 to 800 page document. And even there, you have to go and find it. But they say, oh, no, no, we announced it. It's on page X. Well, yeah, if you read the small print, the fact is, how many people read the budget? Why can't they simply say, okay, in fairness, uh, we raised our taxes 63 6.4%, and the effect on the total tax bill is 2.3%. Now you're being honest. But what they're doing by disguising the 63 they're taking the heat off themselves. And what makes this so bad is that the prior year, they raised the taxes 8.3%. And like you correctly showed that at this rate of increase, the municipal taxes, the city taxes will double in barely 10 years. And that, that's, are... I've had a couple of people question me on that. Um, and just so everyone understands the math, it's a really interesting uh, math equation. It's 1.07 or 1.08, yes. if you think it's going to be uh, 8%, to the power of 10. Correct. And if you do that calculation in your calculator, everyone did it in grade nine or ten. Uh, you'd get a doubling, and that's what's going to happen with our tax and uh, taxes over that's the course right. of the next ten years if uh, we don't do something. Um, and I think Axel, I guess my biggest concern is not only that I think they're misleading the populace. I worry they're misleading themselves. I, I worry they've fooled themselves because uh, you know candidate after candidate that's running for mayor that's currently on council has repeated oh no we increased taxes a modest 2.3 percent they they think in their mind that they're increasing taxes at less than inflation when they're actually two and a half times inflation i think it's I think, I think they fooled themselves well i you know i in, in some respects if they fool themselves then they can change because they'll now understand but i'm worried that they uh, don't have the financial background to ask the questions, why? Uh, why do we need that? Uh, why are we not looking? Why do they not publish the actual wage increases? Why are they not going after uh, insightful analysis of the budget? You know, look at absenteeism, for example. Are they over and under on their capital spending? You'll never see that. Do we need all the bus routes? Uh they don't have the, they're intelligent people, they're educated people, but they don't have the expertise in finance. So they don't have the ability to do a meaningful analysis. One thing that a lot of people don't know is that the 
budget also includes a reserve for a surplus. And in the 2023 budget, there was a surplus budgeted of the equivalent of 4% of the total operating costs, of the net operating costs. So we're not only being taxed at a high rate, but they're putting in reserves to generate extra cash. Some of it is valid. But the point of the fact is we are paying a lot of taxes and they're going to double. And we have no just no honest justification for it. Peter, maybe I can uh, pull you into this conversation. You know, I have uh, been contending that one of the challenges is that we've got uh, several people that are career politicians that haven't been involved in business that are running um, for politics and they're current ca- city councillors. So one would hope that they would have the knowledge, but Axel's, uh, you know, I think pointing out that they may not have that knowledge and certainly they haven't confronted the reality. What's your sense? Uh, do we need someone that's got, you know, 10 or 20 years of political experience or do we, would it be maybe helpful to have someone that's got some business experience in the, in the position of mayor? Well, you look at an organization of uh, 5,000 5, people, you look at a budget of a billion dollars. So it's, uh, to me, one of the, the largest companies they got in the city, right? So obviously we need somebody who has astute financial background. But just coming back uh, to, to, to this taxes, uh, 2014, compare that with 2024. And you know that your tax have doubled. So now an average house is five point five, five thousand five hundred dollars in taxes. So you look between seven to eight years, you look at ten to twelve thousand dollars. Now, if you're on fixed income, I don't know how you're going to do that. It's so what's 12... the what's the solution? Well, the solution is that we have to have somebody who has a little bit financial experience and understand where the heck the money is going. I really I really worry about uh, the course of uh, the city. I've got to tell you, um, I think that this issue on uh, tax increases uh, has not really uh, un- been understood by, by the populace as well as, frankly, by the members of council. But also, you know, I've been to numerous debates and we've talked about numerous issues. We've talked about tax increases. We've talked about inaffordable homes. Uh, we've talked about uh, red tape and regulations and and story after story by CMHC, by StatsCan, by, by uh, you know, politicians in Queen's Park and in the federal government, by reports, by, you know, every single major um, a brokerage or appraisal company says that red tape and regulation are the problem, that it's been taking twice as long, three times as long to get approvals as it needs to get approvals. We've talked about transit that hasn't gotten built. It seems like we don't have a get it done orientation. It's a just, you know, accept the reality of a bad situation and not change it. Do you gentlemen have a, a point on that? Uh, recently on CBC, they announced that more Canadians are leaving Canada and going to the U.S. That was this week, 140,000 was uh, since January. And um, um, so that was kind of like start telling you that People are saying, hey, we're giving up on Canada to go to the U.S. We also have out-migration from the greater Toronto area yeah. to uh, suburban, you know, very um, rural cities in, in Ontario, as well as uh, quite a, a fair Cambridge. amount of migration to Calgary, Edmonton, etc. Exactly. Or Cambridge, Kitchener, just next door. Uh, my son-in-law is now lives in, in Kitchener. And my other son-in-law is looking also to look uh, in that direction. Royal Bank of Canada, RBC, came out with a report about two weeks ago that said there's going to be 2 million people in southern Ontario looking for a home in the next five to seven years, and we're only going to have housing for 1 million of those people. What are those other million people going to do? We're going to drive up the price of housing, making it more unaffordable. Uh, It's as simple as that. And uh, again, we have no mechanism whereby... Uh, we are looking very seriously at the efficiency of the various departments. And we have no leadership within the financial community within uh, the cities uh, to do the proper detailed analysis and come out with information that is relevant to the situation. You never see any reports about their so-called cost reduction efforts. They reduce costs. 
but none of their cost reduction teams ever challenge the processes like approving housing, how it could be done better. Or for that matter, you never see any challenge to say, hey, let's farm it out. Uh, the, the standard response is, while we are under union contract, we're not allowed to farm out. Well, that's one of those elements of red tape. You have presented your point of view on the tax increase at uh, the Marinette debate. Do you think people responded to you adequately? I got a lot. I got a lot of verbal responses, but I have no action. Uh, we're hoping that Marinette will help out and start canvassing its own uh, constituent ratepayer associations to get them to start challenging. Our own experience has been where I got our uh, the ratepayers in my uh, in our group, uh, Sir John's Homestead uh, ratepayers. And uh, we challenged uh, uh, Matt Mahoney. He won't answer. He will not answer. He's defying over a hundred people who've asked him to explain why we don't have proper disclosure of tax increases. In Toronto, in this past year, uh, Olivia Child, the new mayor, put in a you know a ten percent tax increase, and and the media and the people were visibly upset and challenged that. Uh, and there was a lot of discussion about it. You know, if we're going up at 8.4%, why is there not that same sort of fervor? Because it wasn't disclosed. They said it was only 3%. Simple as that. People but people don't have time. Uh, they, they'll listen to a press release. And then the city issues the press release and the media captures the press release. And the, no one at the media goes behind the scenes and says, well, is this really true? They assume that these are ethical people, but so they don't challenge it. Well, 3%, gee, that's too bad. And then they don't seem to catch on. Well, let's add heel onto that. And we're now at 6%. I don't think a lot of people got 6% raises or 7% raises in the last year, let alone whatever it was for 2024. So it's sort of, it's a slider that takes away responsibility from our council. I, agree with you. I think. Go ahead, Peter. And look, where was the debate? I attended the CBC debate at the Living Arts Center. And what was the big discussion? The big discussion was about the bicycle path on Blue Street. Huh? So there was a big debate between uh, in, uh, Alvin and uh, Deepika about why we should have a, a bicycle path on Blue Street. And she would, she would advocate for that. And he would say, well, the decision was already made. And so he spent some 10, 15 minutes on that particular subject. Now, so I think that, you know, that's I, I really, really interesting that you raise it, Peter, because my assessment of that issue is that it's an important issue for the people uh, in that local area that are well, affected. There's no question about it, and they're passionate about it. And probably when something is that uh, passionate, it should be brought back to full council for an airing. But to spend 15 minutes on a debate when, you know, number one, tax increases are going up by two to three times inflation. Number two, I think there's no control over expenditures in the budget. Number three, we have a housing crisis that is primarily the cause of red tape regulation, time uh, delay to get approval. Number three, uh, I can't even remember a moment, three or four, tax, uh, sorry, crime is uh, is on the, crease, on the increase dramatically and we're not addressing it. You know, I've used this line before, but I wonder what you guys think about it. I really think it's sort of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. It's it's really, you know, ad nauseum talking about small issues. So we don't have to confront the big issues that are in front of us. What do exactly. you think about that? Exactly. Exactly. Actually, right. it, sorry. I mean, we are, I'm, I'm a cyclist. I'm a big cyclist. And in many ways, when I cycle, to, I go to cycle to the hospital. And I want to wonder, why do we not widen a little bit the, 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 uh, the sidewalk a little bit? And then you have an easy access to uh, cycle together with the pedestrians. But anyway, I, I digress. But I think really coming back to the to the tax issue, when people get their bill of eight thousand, nine thousand, ten thousand dollar for their taxes, I think there will you see some uh, some movement coming along. But then it's too late. We're going to take a break That's for right. some messages and come back in just two minutes with Axel Barr and Peter Cool. Stay with us, everybody.
Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm chatting today with Peter Cool, who's been involved in uh, Mississauga Society, you know, I think forever, frankly, uh, certainly uh, as long as I've been in Mississauga, and that's been for 24 years. He's been involved in uh, the arts. He's been involved in the symphony. He's been involved in, in Rotary. I ran into him in my church when my church and his church were sharing uh, facilities um, and uh, Lobster Fest and, uh, and in residence organizations right, where they've been dealing with tax increases. And Axel Brower, who is, uh, who is a uh, really smart finance accounting person who has really delved into the tax increases in, uh, in, in Mississauga and, frankly, the expenditures and budgets uh, for, uh, for all, of, uh, all of Mississauga and Peel. Um, Peter, maybe I can turn just for a second to funding of the arts and you know, what we're doing in Mississauga, because I'm a firm believer that arts and culture and, and ways that you know, society interacts some people call it civic capital. Some people call it social capital. Some people call it community spirit. But you know that attitude that brings people together. I'm I'm a firm believer that it is arts, culture, events, festivals, etc. That really bring people together and make them feel like a community. And you know I think Hazel McCallion, the former mayor, you know she funded the Living Arts Center. She funded Celebration Square. She funded uh, uh, and got money for the Hershey Center, etc. Um, I don't think we've been doing a lot of late in that regard. And I've been talking about, you know, whether we should do some retail entertainment down on one port street, whether we should be building um, uh, river uh, riverwood uh, garden center into a, a more substantial entity, whether we should have a Hazel museum. Uh, the art gallery is I think in the wrong place. Um, what do you think of support for and contribution to and dedication to sort of the soft side of city building? You know, I was, at an event uh, just about two weeks ago where uh, in Toronto, uh, the team that are rebuilding the St. Lawrence Center and combining it with the Meridian Center next door talked about how it is going to be the Lincoln Center of Toronto um, or the uh, the Bolshev Ballet, which may not be uh, uh, the right analogy in today's world, but the Bolshev Ballet kind of center uh, for Toronto. Do we have that in Mississauga? Well, let's look at the good things we have. We have a living arts center, which is absolutely a really an incredible place. And um, we were very fortunate at the Hamilton Hall with this incredible acoustics. Uh, they're, they're well renowned over Canada that the Hamilton Hall is, is really on the top there with, with that particular as a facility. But the sad part is that since Ron Lennick passed away, it's become like almost like a little more. There's nothing happening. It is just dead. When one Lennox was operating the place, it was a hopping place. Action was going on. There were things happening. And Lon Rennick passed away. And it is almost like the balloon, the air went out of it. Uh, the only, I see that the, the big thing is Mrs. Argus Symphony does a great job there. But the support for the symphony is very minimal. You compare it, the support that the Mrs. Argus Symphony gets, say, for instance, to what Edmonton gets. The Edmonton Orchestra gets something like seven million dollars in support. Mississauga Symphony gets maybe two hundred thousand. You know, we we live by the, the, the musicians in the Mississauga Symphony. They pay to play. Oh, wow. They pay. The, 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 it is like a club. They pay two hundred dollars per person so they can play the symphony. There are a few are professionals that we have to pay, but that's the situation. So when you go into the Amherst in, in the Living Arts Center these days, I find a very sad situation. I understand that the operation now runs the deficits from, from two million plus dollars a year. So that is a sad situation. And, uh, another some area which is good, uh, the, and you've been involved with that, Brian, for many years, is the Arts Council, who is working very hard in, in developing things for Mississauga and promoting um, artists, writers, filmmakers, poets, and musicians. And you can maybe also comment your experience, what you did there at the Arts Council. Well, it was a great experience. I was on the board for seven years. I was president for uh, two years of the Mississauga Arts Council. Yeah. And I do think it is a an economic opportunity that is missed. Uh, Mississauga is the second or third largest center for film 
uh, production in Canada after Toronto and Vancouver, and we don't realize that. Uh, we become a center for music production. Metalworks on uh, Mavis, where uh, run by Gil Moore, the former drummer for uh, Triumph, is actually a world-renowned music studio and uh, and school. But you know, we haven't grown up a cluster uh, around it. Uh, I think about the the funding the federal government, the provincial government, and the city of Toronto have done for film studios uh, and film activities in Toronto. It is really quite substantial. Uh, I don't think we do the same in uh, in Mississauga. Let me give you two examples, uh, if I could, real quick, of arguments that I've been making that I think that really could recreate sort of the heart, the soul of Mississauga. Uh, down in Port Credit, there is a 150,000 square foot warehouse that sits out into the lake. It's an old uh, Canada Steamship Lines, yeah. um, a lake freighter warehouse. It's on 18 acres of land. Um, and, and there's right now 19 cities around North America that are either proposing or building waterfront retail entertainment. I think this 150,000 acres, if it was in Halifax or Barrie or Vancouver, um, uh, we'd be building something with Canada Lands uh, assistance because Canada Lands, the federal government, actually owns it. And that's what's happening in, in Vancouver, obviously. Uh, uh, they built Granville Island in North Vancouver. They built Lonsdale Key uh, currently in Barrie, currently in Halifax. They're considering comparable kinds of developments. In uh, Chicago, it would be one of the main uh, wharfs. In, in San Francisco, it would be Fisherman's Wharf. In, in Seattle, it would be Pier 5. In, in New York, it would be South Street Seaport. But we're going to build some condos on it because the mayor, because the council, because uh, our planning uh, department is just agreeing to, to maximize value, uh, build 10 more condos when we got thousands of people moving into Brightwater or Lakeview and we're not doing the kind of economic development that we need. Uh, and, and that's the kind of thing that builds, I think, a soul of a city, brings tourism, brings retail, be a great fisher, uh, farmer's market, uh, et cetera. I'll give you one more example. If you take uh, Riverwood uh, at, uh, at Credit View and Burnham Thorpe and you add in Arendelle Conservation Area and the Pinchin Farms, because they're all contiguous, you get 551 acres. It's the third largest urban park in all of North America, only beat out by Central Park and Stanley Park. But because it hasn't been programmed together, because it doesn't have facilities, because it doesn't have events, because it doesn't have the things that make Stanley Park, Stanley Park, you know, think about Stanley Park. It's got the seawall. It's got the uh, the uh, the tea room. It's got uh, the tea house. It's got uh, the the aquarium. It's got the uh, statue uh, totem pole museum. Um, you think about Central Park. It's got the lawn where there's concerts. It's got a skating rink. It's got uh, an art gallery. It's got a museum. It's got, um, you know, incredible walking paths and trails and things like that. Because we haven't programmed it, it brags itself as the hidden jewel. But it should be spectacular. It should be the place where everyone that you know wants to go for a walk on a Saturday or Sunday or has a, a friend coming in from out of town or a tourist that's visiting wants to go there. And it's, it's, I think it's an opportunity squandered. So I guess I ask you, gentlemen, you've been around Mississauga for a long period of time. I think Hazel McCallion had some vision for building those things like the Living Arts Center, Celebration Square, et cetera. Yeah. Do we have a council right now that that has that vision for a better future, a greater future? Right. The one thing uh, also, you know, we talk about costs, et cetera. In our development plans, why can't we have themed development plans? They may be low cost, but we have Cooksville, we have Port Credit. We have a lot of the former villages that uh, uh, having developers create some sort of atmospheric type conditions whereby maybe they create old facades or create some sort of ambiance that says you're in this historical village of X. Enjoy the walkways and uh, just create that alone and that uh, will create will reduce the coldness of a lot of these areas and attract more people to attend them. I think it's a it's an excellent point, Axel. You know, architect after architect, planner after planner tells me that people don't really notice height, but what they really notice is the streetscape. They notice what 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 is at uh, you know their eye level. And if there's lots of nice restaurants, retail uh, shops, historical buildings, etc., they like that. They want to be in that kind of an environment. Um, and the difference between ten and twenty stories, they, they don't they don't notice it at all. And so. If you build the height that allows a developer to make a reasonable amount of money and you can thereby, on a quid pro quo, demand that they have a reasonable streetscape, that makes a lot of positive, positive sense. If what you do is you restrict the density so much that it becomes challenging, what they're going to do is they're going to build blank walls. 
Right. I look at the uh, corner of Pure Ontario Street in Dundas. I consider it disgraceful, whereas you have uh, some historical buildings, and it would be a great opportunity to uh, put together a theme. And I think it wouldn't cost the city anything to do so, because, like you say, you ask the developer, we'll give you an extra few stories to put on your building, as long as you create some sort of atmosphere that attracts people. You see all the advertisements for condominiums, you know, in the paper or on online, and you see these beautiful trees, people walking, et cetera, et cetera. And the stark reality is you got concrete. End of Axel, topic. Axel, you've been you know, working hard, uh, both on your own and through the residence organizations to get the city staff and the city councillors to be responsive to your concerns on, on tax increases and budgets. Do you find them responsive? No. Uh, right now, I think they're ducking for cover uh, simply because they they know uh, uh, that what we have alleged is true, and therefore they know that they have certain legal liabilities that eventually they're going to get caught on. And so they're doing their darndest to try to suppress this. Peter Cool, Axel Brower, thank you so much for joining us. I really uh, appreciate it. Any final words you want to say? Very welcome, Barry. Thank you very much. Thank You're you. Welcome. Have a great day. Bye, We're going to take a break and come back with some more residents in Mississauga in just two minutes. Stay with us.